If you have your Bible this morning, we're in Hebrews chapter 12, as we continue on, nearing the end of our sermon series on faith, faith that matters, where we ask the question, what is real faith? What is saving faith? What does it look like? Is it belief in a creed? Is that what saving faith is? Is it agreement with a doctrinal statement? Does that make one a Christian? Is it asking Jesus into your heart? Is that how we do it? Is that what faith is? Having asked Jesus into your heart? So we've been asking those questions, and the working definition we've come up with as we've gone through Hebrews chapter 11 is that faith is not just a belief to be believed, but a life to be lived and a God to be followed. It is a life to be lived. To believe is to live a certain life, because true faith will impel you to follow Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't tell his disciples, believe in me. He said, follow me. He didn't call them just to believe in their minds. He called them to follow. And what we have in Hebrews chapter 11 uh, is, is a definition of faith. That is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. A faith that is coming to God, believing that He is who He is, and He is a rewarder of those who come to Him. And then it gives an entire long chapter of all kinds of different individuals that shows how that faith impacted their lives. They believed, and their faith directed them to a life. And that was their faith. Without that, you could not have said they had faith. They showed their faith by their lives. And we've looked at those lives down all the way, uh, you know, through Hebrews chapter 11, that sometimes following Jesus in this way means standing alone, like Noah when he built an ark. Sometimes it means leaving comforts, like Abram did, or giving up something precious, as he was willing to do with his son Isaac. Sometimes faith looks like walking away from quote-unquote success. That was Moses, who left the palace for the wilderness, Hebrews tells us by faith. And who also showed us sometimes faith is fearlessly taking risks that people with quote-unquote common sense will say, you really shouldn't do that. It's not safe, yet following God. As we went on through Hebrews, faith is seeing victory, seeing rescue, seeing miracles, and faith is also still believing no less when you don't see victories and don't see rescues and don't see miracles and prayers don't seem to be answered. That's all in Hebrews chapter 11. And believing nonetheless with those things. So, uh, we have gone through Hebrews chapter 11, but we're not done yet. Did you know your, your Bibles were not written with chapters and verses? In fact, the first Bible to have chapter and verses was Geneva Bible in about 1560 AD. And they decided that was after the printing press when more and more people could have the Bible. And they thought, man, wouldn't it be great if we could all turn to John 3.16 and find it right away? So some brilliant person divided the Bible into chapters and verses, and it's been that way ever since. But the chapters are not always 100% accurate. That's human work. That's not divine work. I am personally, in my devotional reading right now, I'm reading through what's called the Reader's Bible, which is a Bible that's written just like a book. There's no chapters, there's no verses, and it's amazing how different it is to read the Bible that way, because as we're reading as through our Bibles, and those chapter and verses like tick, 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 and then you just stop, we come to a chapter, it's time to stop. You know, there, there's kind of a stop there, then you start another chapter, and you really do read it differently, whereas if you're reading like the Reader's Bible, it just kind of flows, and it's the way it was written. Well, the teaching on faith does not stop in Hebrews chapter 11. It goes three verses into chapter 12. And in fact, his conclusion of that little section that he's talking about faith, the conclusion to that section is the first three verses in chapter 12. So we take those today and we'll take a look at them. And it kind of sums up because of all that. So what? It starts with a therefore. You know, when you study the Bible and you ever see a therefore, you ask, what's the therefore therefore? Because it is coming to a culmination. 
All that's been said has a purpose, and here is what we are to be taking with it. So it says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. This is a, a very misunderstood concept because many people see this the way I used to see it. And that is this idea of an arena and a sporting event or something of that nature where you see, okay, we've had all these people in Hebrews chapter 11, and now it says, now, since we have this great cloud of witnesses, as if witness means they're watching us, like we're in the Colosseum and we're, we're now fighting the Christian life and running the Christian race, and all those people are around in the stands cheering us on going, yes, you can do it, you can do it. You may have heard sermons that I think you may have heard them from me in the past. Because it, it ends in verse 40 of chapter 11, that they did not see what's promised because God provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. In other words, an astounding truth. They will not be glorified until the same day we are glorified, ultimately. Resurrected, that kind of thing. So I thought, okay, so they're waiting for us. And what they're doing waiting for us is they're in the arena cheering us on. Unfortunately, that's not what witness means. When we're told in Acts chapter 1 that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses, that didn't mean we were going to be watchers witnessing something. It meant that we were to be actively doers. We would be the ones bearing witness, bearing testimony. And this great cloud of witnesses is all the testimony that these saints of old have offered to us, all the examples of their life, how they lived in faith through difficult circumstances, through strange circumstances, through sometimes good circumstances. But what we have there is this this cloud of witnesses are all those who have borne testimony to us that, yes, this faith is worth hanging on to. This race is worth running. Because in real life, it doesn't always seem like it sometimes. The context of the letter to Hebrews, which, by the way, was not a letter at all. It's a sermon. The context of the sermon of Hebrews. Come to Sunday school today. We're talking about Hebrews, by the way. We'll throw a plug in there. Uh, is written to a group of Jewish background believers who are facing increased and increasing persecution, and there's a danger that they're ready to be giving up and going back to Judaism. Because when it started out, it was great and wonderful as new believers. Now they're realizing that the persecution is really cranking up, and it would be so easy for them to go back and end all persecution. Let's go back to Judaism. And so the whole thrust of the book is, how can you do that after you know Jesus? How can you ever go back to those things that were only shadows of what was to come, which the reality is Jesus? And so he's telling these people, you're running this race and you're going to need endurance. And look at all those who have gone before and left you a path and given you an example of sticking with it right to the end. By the way, Think of Timothy at the very end. Not, excuse me, not Timothy. Paul writing to Timothy. Second Timothy. Paul at the very end. Paul, one of the greatest, if you want to rank people this way, which the kingdom of God does not, but we humans do, one of the greatest Christians that's ever lived. Kingdom of God does not rank people that way, but we do. Uh, humans do. At any rate, at the end, Paul didn't say to Timothy in his last words to him, wow, yeah, I've done well. Look at all the churches I've planted. Look at all the letters I've written that have made it into the Bible. What he says is, he says, I have finished the race. I've run the course. I've kept the faith. I've gotten to the end, and I'm still with it. That's what he gloried in. In fact, if you look back at the Hebrews 11, those patriarchs, you know, we, we talked a lot about Abraham. What about Isaac and Jacob and Joseph? All it said about them was at the very end of their lives, they were still faithful. So writing this, he says, okay, here's, here's where we're going with all this. You've, you've heard all these stories of all these people. Now, since we have all those testimonies, all those examples set before us, all those trails that have been left for us to follow, because of that, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The example he lays out is faith is an endurance race that has been set out for us. 
One of my kids, Matt, ran cross country for a couple years. Cross country, interesting sport. I always considered it a torture sport. Basically, you just run and you run and you run and you run, and when you can't do it anymore, you keep on running, and many times you get to the end, you cross the line and you throw up. Good times. Uh, but it's also a sport that's very much builds great unity in the team, and it's for personal endurance. What's interesting is if you go to the Birchwood Golf Course the day before a cross-country meet, you'll see there's a course being laid out. You'll see people with chalk lines. And you'll see people putting up posts that they have to run around. And somebody's going to be there watching them, make sure they go around and not the shortcut. And the, the race is set out, and they have to run the course that is set out for them. And it's a perfect example of what he says here. He says, since we have this great cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside all those things that are going to be weighing us down. When you run cross country, you're not going to put a backpack on your back full of all your books from the school last Friday and run with that. That would just not be a good idea. You're going to wear as few clothes as you can possibly wear to be covered up and stay warm. You're not going to eat a real big meal right before you run. Yeah, the day before you might want to put some carbs in there, but you want to prepare yourself to be as light and free as possible. And the writer of Hebrews says now, okay, this, this faith thing, it's an endurance right. Let's get rid of all the stuff that bogs us down. All those things that get in the way of us following our Lord and living the life of faith that he has called us to live. And those sins that tangle us up, that become entangled with us. And it says, run that race that is laid out for you. I believe Ephesians 2.10 is true. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 talks about grace, free grace. We're saved by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 10 tells us, for we are his workmanship. We are his masterpieces. We are his project. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We have a course laid out for us. Every one of us has a course laid out for us by God. Following him in grace, in the life of faith, is a life of running the course that he has laid out, not ours. See, we have our courses laid out. But he has a course laid out for us. That's why it's not just a belief in a creed. It is a life to be lived and a God to be followed who has set out the course. Now, that doesn't mean specifically you have called to be in an exact place, doing an exact thing in an exact way. It's fluid. But he has called us. He's gifted us uniquely with gifts that we are to one another, and we are called to live them. We are called to exercise them. We are called to serve him in the ways he has gifted us and called us. And our life is a life of figuring that out as we follow him. Now, it doesn't mean there's a certain place you have to be. And until you get there, you're not in God's will. So your job is to find God's perfect will for you and then go there and then you'll be in his. No, it's wherever you are. Wherever you are, the calls to follow him. He'll get you to where he wants you as you follow him. The Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey thought, okay, I think I'm supposed to go south. Boom, hit a wall. Said, okay, I think I'm supposed to go north. Boom, hit a wall. Said, okay, I guess that leaves west. He goes in, he hits water. Of course, then speaks to him a dream and says, yeah, come on across. That's where you're supposed to be. As we go, we figure that out. But it's a life of following him, of seeking what his will for us would be. It's that course that is laid out for us that we are called to run, just like a cross-country course is laid out. And then it says to run with endurance. It's not for the fastest. It's about finishing in the, the course of faith. Remember, that's what Paul gloried in to Timothy at the end. Not all the things he'd accomplished, but the fact that he had run the race, he had finished the course. He had kept the faith. He says, therefore, Jesus himself is going to give me the crown. And so that's, I guess we can add to our definition. You know, faith is not just a belief to be believed, but a life to be lived and a God to be followed. Let's add to that with endurance. With endurance, because it's a life of endurance. Follow 
until the end. We're called to nothing less. So how do we do that? Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The final call there is to fix our eyes on Jesus. What is the goal? What is the goal in your life? It's good to ask that question. Examine your hearts. What's the goal? Right now, what are your goals in your life? Is it to build up that retirement account so that in those coming days you can just have a life where you don't answer to anybody and get up whatever you want to and you can travel and you can do all the things you always... Is that it? That's your goal? That's a pretty good human goal. A lot of people's goal is that. Is your goal to accomplish a certain, to reach a certain position in a job? Is your goal to find a place of personal happiness to where you feel really good about yourself? All those are, you know, think, well, it sounds like good goals. But what is your goal? What's the goal of the walk of faith, of the life of following Jesus? Paul had a pretty good handle on that. We've looked at Philippians 3 before in this, in this study, and we will do it again. Philippians chapter 3, and uh, let's see, where shall we start there? He says in verse 7 of chapter 3 of Philippians, Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it, I've already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We go back to Hebrews. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Verse 3, consider him who has endured such hostility that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Paul says, that's my goal, Jesus. That upward call, that is my goal. Everything else can be things that just bog me down in that. Seeking for my own personal pleasures and those kind of things might just be things that bog me down in that race. So we fix our eyes on him. Remember at the end what he said? What's so good about it? I've kept the faith. I've run the race. I've finished the course. Now I'm going to get the crown of that upward call from him. That's what his eyes were fixed on all the time. He gave away all the he gave away his retirement account. The apostle Paul, he gave that away. That was the rubbish that he let go of for the surpassing value. And I'm not telling all of you now if you're going to follow Christ, you need to get rid of your retirement accounts. But it's good to consider what owns your heart and what is your goal. Because where your heart is, there you will follow. And that will be the thing that you serve. So we're called to fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter. He's the one that started it. He's the one who will finish it. He started it on the cross. He will finish it when he returns on that day of resurrection for all of us. That day the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints are awaiting for. That we all look forward to with great joy. And the... The danger of, is of wearing out. 
He does do all these things so you do not become weary and lose heart. That idea, I think, what does it, it literally say? It's, it literally is of the fainting of your souls. Don't let your souls faint. Don't lose all of your spiritual energy because things will not um, automatically go right for you as Christians in this world. In fact, some things, because you're a believer in Jesus, will go against you. Because of that, it will be difficult swimming against the current of society. Guaranteed. And not every prayer will be answered. And you'll have to deal with that. Because God has greater wisdom than we do. And he loves us as a true and, and wonderful father. So we are called in this life of faith to live a life that follows him. That asks the question, what would you have me do, Lord? What would you have me do with your possessions that you've entrusted to me? What would you have me do with your time that you've given to me? What would you have me do with your money that you've made me a steward of? What would you have me do with the talents and abilities and gifts you have given me day by day? Lord, what do you want me to do? What are you calling me to do? Because as I follow you, I'm running that race. And the goal of that race is the crown that you will give to me. It's the crown of eternal life. It's that resurrection day when we enter his very presence. That's the goal. Is that the goal of your life? Well, I'm sure it's one of them. Is that the main one? That's the question we ask our hearts. That's the question the Holy Spirit invites us to ponder as we consider what is real saving faith. It's not just believing in the creed. It's living a life of following Jesus that he has laid out. It's getting out of the driver's seat and not even sitting gun, getting in the back seat and letting him guide this life that we now share as we receive the gift of his Holy Spirit. And so this is what faith really is. It's a life of following him, a life that calls for endurance. Because it's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy. It's for the joy set before him that Jesus endured the cross. It's for the joy set before us that we run the race. In the cross country, it's the joy of finishing and being a part of a team that's encouraging you as you finish, no matter how you might be doing along the way. And at every point, it's just keep going, keep going, go for the prize. It's not to be the fastest, it's to finish. That's our faith. We're going to do one more uh, sermon, I think, in this series, and we're going to leave Hebrews and go to James, who has some, some interesting things to say about what faith is well that fits right in. But Let's pray.